If you will open to 2 Peter chapter 3, please. I want that to be our text there in, in Peter 3 and 4, verses 3 and 4. Second Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. Knowing this first, Peter writes, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Then verse 5, we'll add to it, for this they willingly are ignorant of. And by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Wherefore, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now that last verse, verse 7 tells us that the end of time is reserved as far as people of this earth are concerned for those on this earth who are wicked people. And notice how he says it, the judgment of per and perdition of ungodly men. You may remember that not long ago with the beginning of the Olympics in Paris, a uh, great controversy, at least to some extent, arose because there are a group of what's called, quote, drag queens, unquote. And they appeared in their whatever to present or to represent the Last Supper as it's depicted by Leonardo da Vinci's painting. And it was an awful spectacle. And if you dare want to go look at it, you can go to the YouTube or somewhere like that and you can find it. It was a mockery. And that's the idea of what is said here of scoffers. Scoffers mock. They make light of very serious matters. It's not unusual for wicked people to do that. They cannot stand for people to be, quote, better, unquote, than they are. And by that I mean living by a moral or spiritual standard that causes them to oppose certain sins of a moral spiritual nature in this case morality and spiritually hooked together they were scoffing at the last supper depicted by Leonardo da Vinci or not Leonardo would not have had that to paint and give his concept of it except that he read it in the Bible in the first place it was a scoffing of that which is very very serious the word profane or profanity we usually use when it comes to foul language, especially using God's name in vain. But it's really more widespread than that. They were engaged in doing this thing regarding the Lord's Supper and mocking it and scoffing at it. They were profaning it. They were taking that which is meant to show forth the Lord's death that he come again to be done by those who place their faith in Christ in obedience to his gospel and living according to the will of Christ, thus worshiping him and as an act of worship, observing the Lord's Supper. They scoffed at it. They openly and publicly made light of it. There was that kind of thing done in the first century when it came to Christians. But we, in recent years, have seen it come upon us. And that's because our culture is becoming more godless. And believers in Christ as the Son of God and Savior of the world, those who follow the teachings of Christ, are ridiculed and our targets of ridicule 
they are in some way or the other harassed. In many cases, they're simply cut off. And there have been a few places in the world where they have undergone much physical violence. Well, that has been the case in some places where God and Christ of the Bible were not accepted. But now, even where those things are, were predominant and woven into the fabric of that society, there now is a growing antagonism toward God, toward Jesus Christ as a Son of God, toward His church, toward His gospel, toward Christians. This is exactly what Peter was talking about. Now, if they, our brethren of long ago, could live through that kind of thing, if they could be faithful through it, and God expected them to do that as a part of their faithful service to Him, so can we. What may very well happen is that the ranks of those who claim belief in God and the Bible is the Word of God and Christ is the Son of God and that one must live according to the gospel, what may happen is that the church may be thinned out considerably because this kind of thing is going to test the mettle of every one of us. It already is. Peter explained that the mockers or those who scoffed were ridiculing at that time the promise of Christ and His coming, 2 Peter 3, 4. And in particular, they were scoffing at the judgment. I listened not long ago to a person who's still a, a celebrated actor over in England, an atheist. He was interviewed. And they were talking to him about how there can be pain and hurt in this world and yet Christians say God is love. What do you think about that, they ask him. And what would you do if you had a chance to speak to that kind of God? Well, he took off on a tirade of what he would say to that God that he wouldn't have nothing to do with a God like that and all of those things and much, much more than I want to go into here now. But it was typical of those who deny the existence of God and try to say, well, if they're suffering here and he's a loving God and he has the power to stop it, why did it ever begin and all that kind of stuff. Nobody ever says, well, there's a devil. Man's a free moral agent. And he's been put in a place where he can choose. And the devil appeals to him. If he chooses wrong, he suffers the consequences and brings all this stuff that happens into this world. But I don't mind saying that this world is absolutely perfect, as you've heard me say before, for what God made it to be. And he didn't make it a place to live forever. He made it a place perfect for getting ready to live in heaven. And if we're not living our lives, using this life, to choose to believe and obey God and reject everything that handicaps that and overcoming the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, we flunk life and we get an F minus. And we'll hear, depart from me, I never knew you, ye that work iniquity, into the everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. Now that fellow I mentioned, the atheists in England and many others, these characters at the Olympics this year, they were mockers and scoffers. They were profane people. They took that which is very serious and critical, the most critical and serious thing you can have in this life, and they made light of it. They were flippant with it. They mocked it, and they scoffed at it. Are we, as New Testament Christians, are we ready to deal with that? Do we know how to deal with it? Are we determined to be faithful no matter what? Because it's going to come to you in the workplace and to me wherever we are. If we were speaking more out in public today 
what the truth of God is in every aspect of it, in other words, the whole counsel of God, you would see, I think right now, people standing up and scoffing at us. Maybe even shouting us down. Maybe even inflicting violence upon us. That's our culture. That's the society in which we live. And I think it's just outside that door. We talk about facing reality. That's the reality. Of course, I can remember a time, and many of you can too, when that was not the case. I found it interesting to go back over 40 or 50 years ago and reading articles about such things as this. And now the majority of the country would rise up and not accept all of this. I don't think those articles could be written today. And it's foolish to think that it doesn't present itself in the schools or with our neighbors at the workplace, certainly in government and in politics. When someone running for the president can say concerning abortion, as they always do, the right of the woman. What about the rights of the unborn child? They never speak of that. If you're pregnant and don't want it, kill the baby. And now you hear somebody say, well, surely, religiously, that's no big thing. And there are religions that embrace that kind of thing. And they mock life as God gave it and when life began and the life of the unborn. That's just the way it is. And it's interesting that among conservative people in this country, the top concern, so the polls are saying, in this upcoming election is this. Economy. That doesn't surprise me. Bread always has outdone the Bible. A full plate always has outdone the hungry and thirsting after righteousness. So even those who say, we are conserving, I ask, what are you conserving? Well, they're conservative. I want to ask people when they say that, what do you mean by that? Conserving what? Conserve means to keep it, to not give it up, to not abuse it, to protect it, to hold on to it, to conserve it. What do they mean? Have you ever asked your friends that? Don't just accept the idea, I'm a conservative. Conserving what? Well, I think I'm a conservative, and I can tell you what I conserve, the will of God and the doing of it above and beyond anything else on this earth, no matter what. And I'm a liberal too. Liberal in giving. You have to be. Romans 12, 1 and 2. We're to yield our bodies a living sacrifice unto God, which is our reasonable service. Thus I am opposed to everything, liberal or conservative, that is in opposition to God and His Word and the will of heaven on earth being done on earth. But this earth is perfect for what God made it to be, and that's the place to get ready for heaven. And if you're not getting re ready for heaven now, you may find your children and your grandchildren scoffing at the very things that the Bible teaches as to being important and needful and obligatory in this life. Peter warned, in 2 Peter 3 and verse 7, But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store. Kept in store for what? They're in storage. They're kept in store. Think about that. Reserved. They're reserved for a particular matter. What is it? Unto, in order to give in point, what? Fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. 
It doesn't make any difference how many people deny the existence of God or the deity of Christ or the Bible is the word of God or the gospel is the power of God to save or the church and its work, organization, worship. It doesn't make any difference. It does not change the truth of God's word. And without that truth, we're nothing. In fact, we become a part of those reserved for the day of, un of the judgment of ungodly people. So just as death is a certainty for all, so is the great divine judgment. The Hebrews writer said it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. Hebrews 9.27 I was talking to a young man not long ago when I went into the gym We've worked up a pretty good casual acquaintance to where we say barb at one another and make comments where we can visit. I forgot what he said exactly, but it allowed me an opportunity. And I said, have you ever heard this verse? I don't know that he's heard much of any verses. But have you ever heard of this? And it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. I said, what does that mean to you? He smiled. He said, well, he just kind of shrugged it off. And there's your, there's your population. There's your friends and neighbors. I think he said he was 22 years old. Paul told the Corinthians, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that we may give account of the deeds. One version says recompense. Give account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 The average secularist, Thinks of death, it just ends it all. All of his hopes, aspirations, care, whatever. That's it. He doesn't think beyond the death of the body. And if he does, through some perverted idea of the Bible, he always gets himself into a lot better place after he dies. He doesn't know much what that place is. It's sort of like the song says, to a beautiful isle of somewhere. He doesn't really know where that is or what it's like. But he doesn't think about eternal punishment because he didn't serve God here. He doesn't realize that we're on probation before God in the flesh. That's the reason we're here is to show God we love Him or we don't. We have faith in Him and His system of salvation or we do not. That's the reason we're here. And the writer of Hebrews, or rather Ecclesiastes said, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments for this is the whole duty of man. People don't know that. The sad part about it is many of them don't. And so it is many people who seemingly, they're going to treat you nice or whatever, but they don't know anything about the Bible. Others are rank mockers and scoffers. The mockers, the scoffers, are calling God's promise into question when they do this. According to them, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. 2 Peter 3, 4. And they may not say it was created. They just may say it was always here. However, that's an example of the providence of God. Not a failure on His part to keep His promises. God's ongoing care. All things physical and all the laws of nature upheld by the word of his power, which word coming from him brought them all into existence. Even for the ones who reject him, his care for those things. Think about that. People denying him and scoffing right now. God still blesses them with all the ways this works in this natural world. They don't know it. But all these things act as a witness of his power and of his goodness toward them. Acts 14, verses 16 through 17. Paul used that, according to Luke, as he recorded it, as a beginning place to prove the existence of God, that all these things continue on in an orderly fashion. Something has to have brought it into existence, the way the world works. Something must continue it as it goes and as it works and has worked. But they don't acknowledge that. They ignore that. They scoff at that. Now, the reason that they are scoffers or mockers are making a light of God's judgment 
is simple. It's said in 2 Peter 3 and verse 3. They're following after their own lust. People live in the flesh, period. But are you going to follow the will of God as to how to live in the flesh? And to keep your desires and passions under the control of Christ through obedience to His will? Or are you going to reject His will and anything pertaining to God and live to suit your appetites of the flesh? You have no choice. You will go one way or the other. You'll either be sensual and materialistic and secular or you're going to be godly and spiritual and righteous. The second of those comes only through knowing and an honest heart doing, Luke 8, 15, what God said. These kind of people, these scoffers, these mockers, want to engage in behavior that is sinful and evil. But, now there's one thing about them and you, and you have to destroy it before you can do some things, and sometimes they don't. It drives them to be mentally off. That is, they have a conscience. I remember one time talking to a gospel preacher, and he was telling about a fellow who had, well, in fact, this preacher was, was an elder at the time, and this person came to him as an eldership, he along with the other elders, to go through matters in his own life. And he was explaining how he got himself into this thing. He didn't think a thing in the world about it, just when he did it. And then it got next to him, and I never will forget what the fellow said to me in explaining about this other one. He said he found out he had a conscience. He found out he had a conscience. His conscience was pricked. It bothered him. It upset him at what he had done. And I suggest that we in the church is striving to preach the gospel of these souls whom God died for, though perverted they are that we try to appeal to their conscience. Now to do that, you have to inform them with the truth of God. The conscience is the highest court in your person. It just simply says, feel very good. You're living up to whatever standard you consider to be the standard for your life. Or feel very bad. You violated it. So we've got to teach them the proper standard. And I think one of the things that we ought to saddle upon people so that people will learn they have a conscience is what they're doing to the unborn child. If a mother can abort her baby, murder her baby, then that mother has put by all natural affection that was normally built into her and had to go against that. And yet the Bible teaches they will be without natural affection. Paul warned Timothy about that, of some without natural affection. Natural is by nature built into you what you are. And I think we ought to cause them to know they have a conscience and that it will eat them alive when they violate the will of heaven and start right there at one of the most intimate things there is. Paul warned that by paying attention, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons that one's conscience could be seared, 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2, so that, no, so that folks no longer feel guilt. Well, folks, that's the most dangerous thing you can think of. To when, when you do wrong, knowing it's wrong, you don't feel guilty. People on the day of Pentecost, on the day the church started, those Jews gathered there, are described as devout Jews gathered from every nation under heaven. And upon the proclamation of the gospel and all of the events that were miraculous on that day, proving that what was happening was from God and not from man, they heard the message. And they were caused to believe in Christ and they were guilty of their sins. Peter had said, You have taken him with wicked hands, have crucified and slain the Son of God. Now when they heard this, 
They were pricked in their heart. And they cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Would to God we could reach the consciences of people like that today. And they would cry out in their hearts, What must we do that we could tell them, as Peter did to those believers, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children, all them that are far off, as he spoke to those Jews. But then he said, and all them that are far off, those non-Jews. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, he did exhort them to save yourselves from the crooked generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Would to God people had that kind of conscience today and that kind of concern for the obvious and were that honest in their reasoning that when they heard the word it would promote that kind of thing in them. You see, we can live so, in such a way as to keep a, keep a tender conscience. In your prayers, do you ever pray for a heart easily pricked by the truth when it's, when it's gone awry? We all do. We ought to want to keep our hearts honest and we want to keep our hearts pure and tender. To use the language of the Lord through the great prophet Jeremiah. Though those people of that time had done terrible and abominable acts. And they were not even ashamed at all, the scripture says. And did not even blush, Jeremiah 6.15. Thus I go back to those people in Paris who did what they did in mockery of the Lord's Supper. It didn't bother them. They didn't blush. They weren't ashamed. They were making light of it. They were profane people. They did not appreciate and do not appreciate important matters. Matters of the spirit. Matters of the soul. When Paul described the guilt of the Gentiles in Romans 1... Verses 29 through 32, including the unnatural and the indecent practice of homosexuality, verses 26 and 27. The reason why they were able to go so far into these heinous sins, because they didn't see fit to acknowledge God any longer. And thus, God, looking at them, having the right to choose, putting them in the place where they could choose Him and His way or their own way, gave them up to a depraved mind and to do those things which are not convenient in the American standard and means not proper, Romans 128. We can corrupt ourselves, and many have, and our society is conducive to that. Our society, our culture, is not conducive to believing in God and Christ and the Bible. It's right the opposite. So what are we going to do? We're Christians. We acknowledge everything they scoff at. And we've got to live with it. And it's going to challenge our faith, our trust, our confidence in God and His system as these things grow stronger. These folks in Romans 1 had completely rejected God. They wanted to. They did not desire to retain God in their knowledge. And thus he allowed them to take the path they had chosen and look where it led them to. Exactly what we're seeing in this nation today. It always has. It always will. So this is the state of many people today, especially those who engage in all of this horrible sexual deviant behavior as you read of in Romans 1, 26 through 27. Or in the Old Testament when it comes to Sodom and Gomorrah. Then there are those who may not actually, and this is typical of this culture too, who may not actually engage in those things, but they give their approval of it. All they want is to say, you do what you want to. That's what we're doing, but don't condemn us. Don't say that we're wrong. Don't try to bind on us as, our way of, as your way of conduct, and that's the way they look at it. What you believe, live and let live. If you want to go ahead and believe in God and do those things, fine. Just don't point out 
we're in sin and wrong, and everybody ought to live the way you're living. But the church being faithful to God cannot remain silent. These folks have rejected God and His standard in favor of their own depravity. So what did they do? What I said in the beginning. They scoff at God and anything pertaining to Him. They mock God. They mock all things holy. They are profane people and they ridicule those that love the truth and obey it and preach the truth. And they will attack you. And we're going to have to go back and learn how the Bible says Christians deal with that. As the mockers ridicule the prospect of God's judgment, as Peter talked about it here, Peter explained that they had forgotten. Look in 5 and 6. For this, they are willingly ignorant. I don't know that we emphasize enough how one can be willingly ignorant. That means you have the opportunity to be enlightened. You know it's important to be enlightened, but you choose not to be. I've run across certain brethren like that. As the church is apostatized years and years ago, different things would come up. And I've heard actually elders say this. Well, it's not bothering us here. I don't want to hear anything about that. That's willingly ignorant, you know. That's saying I don't know anything about it and I don't want to know anything about it. Well, then when it comes knocking at your door or walking in and sitting on the front pew, then you come hollering, squalling, carrying on what's happened. Well, it's you. You didn't want to know. Thus, you left the door wide open. Now, you can do that to your own life. And that's what's happening in a lot of places. And as far as this nation is concerned, that's exactly what's happened to the nation. We don't realize in just the last, well, since World War II, let's say, just how much patriotism and things like that have gone down the drain in this nation. It's scoffed at, it's ridiculed, and it's mocked. The Constitution is frowned at, it's kicked at, and law is made out to be anything you want it to be. So you have your truth, and I have my truth. And on and on it goes, and it's gradually infiltrated the whole of the nation. Now that creates an atmosphere soil, if you please, in the, mi in the minds of men being compared to soil to where it's not conducive to receiving the truth of God. And we in the church need to understand that. We just don't realize, though we will say it, we don't really realize how much of the truth of God's word was involved in this nation's beginning. That doesn't mean everybody was a Christian. Doesn't mean everybody was what they ought to be. But it was ingrained in them. And thus, they made choices based upon fundamental matters of morality and of conduct and so forth that's set out in the Bible. But now that's repudiated. It's been being repudiated for the whole of the 20th century, starting in the 19th century, and it's gradually infiltrated right on through our land. Now it's in the church. It's in the people who believe in Christ. And now you can just do about anything. And God's going to accept you if you really don't believe in Him. Matthew 24, 37-39, we have mentioned the coming of the Son of Man. And He says when He comes the second time in the clouds, it'll be as it was in the days of Noah. They were eating and drinking Marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah went into the ark. And Noah went in there when God told him to go in there. They didn't understand the thing until the flood came and took them all away. And then he says it. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. People will be doing just like they are right now. When the Lord comes back again. And then boom! It's over. Christ is here. You don't have to go home and eat dinner. You won't have to listen to another sermon. It won't be an invitation. It ended. The earth will melt with fervent heat. Everything will be dissolved. All men will be judged.
according to the deeds done in the body. I'm amazing it's how well some of your reflexes operate when I did that. Just before, I don't know how the reflexes will be when it actually happens. Just before all of that, Jesus explained that his return to judge the world would be completely unannounced. But that day and hour knows nobody. Angels in heaven don't know it. And at that time, neither the Son of Man, only the Father, knew it. Matthew 24, 36. No signs. It just happened, just like I did it. You didn't expect it. Only I knew. And I just decided to split second before I did it. <laughs> Point is, God only knows right now. How do you know he's not saying in heaven to his son, time to go down and get him? He knows the time, the exact time. Now, I've said all this simply to say nothing new here, but I hope it reminds us of how easily we can slip slide away and let this present world, because we're a part of it, and it gradually has come to where it is, bog us down in it. We get to where we're complacent. We accept it. So it should be no surprise that mockers and scoffers would come and ridicule God, the Savior of man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and all things pertaining to godliness. They'll also mock that he's coming again. But the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 9. Because the Lord is not yet returned, we have time to repent. And anytime you look at a watch, you ought to let it teach you something. Every click of that is because God's long suffering doesn't want anybody to be lost. He wants people to turn to him in the gospel of Christ, obedient to it, and become a Christian as we've studied. He wants them to come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, 2 Timothy 2, 26. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Don't put your hopes in this world. It's, it's leaving. Don't put your hopes in the body. It's going to be gone. The whole system's going to be dissolved. There won't be any laws of nature. There won't be any nature. There won't be any earth. If we could but just realize that just beyond our human sight, there's eternity and just as real as we are real in the flesh in this world but this is a transient place and we're but pilgrims and we need to use this place for what God intended to obey the Lord to make whatever sacrifices are necessary to undergo scoffing at and mocked at but to stay true to the book and as Jesus said be thou faithful unto death and you'll receive a crown of life Revelation 2.10. Do you need to obey the gospel? It's the only thing that's going to help you since all of this has come to an end. It's the only thing you have. Obey the gospel. Be ready. Live the Christian life. If you're a child of God, have you slipped, slid away and kind of become a part of all of this? It just doesn't bother you. It ought to bother you. Remember what's said and then we'll close of, of Lot and the mess that it was morally and spiritually in Sodom. Peter said, it vexed righteous Lot from day to day, living that mess. And I don't know, but that a day goes by that my mind is not vexed at the mess we have to deal with. Where can you turn one way or the other? Where can you go anywhere that you're not accosted by the wickedness of this present world being taken is just a normal way of life. We live in a profane, evil world, and the devil rules it. Jesus is beckoning to us to obey the truth and be saved. And if you need to do that, we urge you to obey the gospel or as a Christian to repent of any sins and do so now while we stand and sing.